Okay, live from Silver Speech Speaker Series. Today we have two special guests for Cerebral Palsy Awareness. Um, I have my first, one of my first clients, Kayla Ireland. You met her a couple weeks ago. I'm discussing um, her her success with cerebral palsy and her challenges with cerebral palsy. And now we also have my very, one of my very first friends in elementary school who grew up together, um, Katrina Darcy, as I know her, but now she's Katrina James. Um, and she also grew up with cerebral palsy. And I'm so happy to introduce both of them together because they, can now communicate whenever they want to and give each other tips and also vent about anything they need to. So how we're gonna run this today is I'm gonna ask them a series of questions. I'm gonna take turns so we get to hear both sides. Um, and also we will have time for you both to ask each other questions or me questions, um, but you are the experts. I am, I don't know a ton about cerebral palsy because I don't have cerebral palsy and I don't have a lot of clients right now that have cerebral palsy. Um, so let's get started. I'm gonna start with you, Kayla. Name the most influential person in your life and why. My entire family is encouraging, supportive, understanding, caring, helpful, hilarious, and goofy. All the friends and acquaintances we have are so inclusive, including our dance family. I have to shout out to my mom as we have been home together since last March. I love it. I agree with you about your family. I actually have known you for, for since you were three. So, but I remember when your sister was born um, cause you were in school then um, and that was um, exciting. Um, and then I got to meet her later. She came to New York city with mom. So that was so, I can understand why your family is your number one. And she has two sisters. So not just one, but two. I never got to meet the other one yet, but we have to have an in-person visit for sure. I owe you a visit because you couldn't come to New York that weekend. So I said, I owe you a visit and then pandemic happened. So uh -huh. ruined it for us. Okay, <laughs> next we have Katrina. Tell me who your influential person in your life was and why. Um, growing up, my dad died when I was very young, like 10. So I spent some time in foster care. And then um, my sisters mainly growing up, they were very protective. I have six sisters, no brothers. So, and then as I got older, I really do have a good group of friends. I always did, even in high school. But um, I've just, they've always been just supportive, um, sometimes too supportive, sometimes too overprotective. We won't name any of them, but sometimes they're a little crazy. <laughs> but, you know, overall, they've been very accepting and good to me. I can't complain. And, you know, Dr. Roy, who's with Weinberg Cerebral Palsy Center, is an amazing individual who's dedicated his life to teaching and advocating for people with CP. I um, owe it to him. I probably would be wheelchair bound right now if he didn't step in and make my hip surgery happen. So I'm very grateful for that. He's retired and moved to China to consult. So we miss him here, but thankfully I had him for the time that I did and was able to get the surgery that I needed. 
Wow, that's really helpful to know um, that there's doctors that just specialize in cerebral palsy. Um, I know that Katrina has some things to add about that, so we will get to that. Um, and I remember your six sisters growing up. I remember the house that you lived in. I remember, you know, walking to your house and back. And um, we used to go skiing together. We did. I have not skied in since after high school, but I want to get back into it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, very important people in my life are not too happy about that. <laughs> Uh, they just they look at the disability and not the ability mm. so they but they don't know me as the skier they know me as who I am right now and not you know they haven't seen that side of me so yeah hopefully by the next ski season if the doctor says okay maybe they'll change their mind <laughs> and I loved it because you know, I had skis and you had skis but you had cool skis I didn't you know so <laughs> Yeah, when you're when you're neurotypical and someone has something that you don't have, it's cool, you know. You so tried my skis though, remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's super super cool that we had that experience together, um, and then connecting based on thank goodness for Facebook because we wouldn't be here today without mm -hmm. Facebook, right? Um, and then just reminiscing about all those memories. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know. Katrina and I are in our 40s and Kayla is half of our age. So she is, you know, here to share on her experience in school growing up in the 2000s versus 1980s, which is a huge change. Um, has been, there's just been so many changes that happen in education. So I'm first going to ask Kayla to comment on her overall school experience um, from you know pre pre K through twelfth grade and even further on. My overall school experience was awesome. I was mainstreamed and involved in a variety of clubs. In middle school, I was in a community service club called Kids in the Middle. In high school, I was in track, drama club, and an intern. My theater advisors always found a spot for me. I was a greeter handing out the program, painted, and was a cast member. For track, I attended two practices a week and participated in the stretching as much as I could then walk laps in my walker. I ran the 100 meter at home games competing against my own time. Even though I competed against myself, along with my family, my coaches, teammates and spectators cheered me on. OMG! My first ever track meet was in the pouring rain. We had to take a hair dryer to my wheelchair afterwards. In regards to field trips and senior activities, I participated in most of these activities. For example, on prom night I was one of the few people who were the last ones to leave and I even went to the after prom breakfast. Amazing. So that is, you know, huge in terms of inclusion and making sure that you know, you're a part of everything. And what's, I, you know, as someone who does not have a disability, um, it's just very important to know that we are in competition with ourselves. There, it doesn't matter, you know, if so-and-so is doing something or so-and-so, you know, where are you in comparison to that person? And, and, it, and it took a long time as an adult to realize that you know, mm -hmm. so to hear these things that you had your, your own time and your own, you know, improving on your own time versus somebody else. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, we're, we're in this together, you know, life together, but, you know, personal goals, um, staying in your lane, right. Mm -hmm. Being, um, and this is, I mean, it's really important for people to know that, that, you know, and, and you're, 
enthusiasm and your happiness and the, sh the challenges that you go through doesn't stop you from mm -hmm. competing, from going to college, um, joining theater. Um, all of those things are so important um, and it didn't stop you. Now we have Katrina here who went, we went to school together in, when did you? Jennings, or I Jennings. met you in Jennings, but I was in the Bristol school system before that. Okay. So when I was 10, I spent most of my summer at the children's hospital having my first set of series surgeries. And when it was time to go back to school, I believe I was at Southside Elementary School. And my mom actually had to call the mayor because they didn't want to let me in the school system because I was in a wheelchair at that point. So it was this whole big to do thing because they didn't think they could accommodate me. Well, we won the battle. I mean, obviously, but it's just so very different now. It's people are more educated now, I think. I don't think they did it to be harmful in any way. I just, it was lack of knowledge back then. So I think that that's what it stemmed from. I don't think it was malicious or anything like that. I think it was just people are, weren't educated as they are today because it's technology has come so far since I was even Kayla's age, you know? So I think yeah. that I do remember that. And overall, you know, I, I was part of a program called Skiers Unlimited. I actually skied on a competitive level um, for many years. And then I, if my sisters took dance, I took dance. So I was never really allowed in my family to be disabled. I was always treated as an equal. So, and, and that's good. And I don't remember ever having, I mean, there was one kid in high school that was just terrible to me that like still sticks with me. And he used to trip me in the hallway and my mom's name was Mary. So he used to sing, Mary had a limping lamb, but overall, I mean, I had the best friends and it was just that one off, you know, everybody was pretty nice. And I had a good group of people always, but it's very different now than it was then. Wow. And I think it's just lack of knowledge back then versus now. Yeah, I think so too. I think ignorance is bliss, you know, people that they don't know any better. And I think, you know, we all, we all do that, you know, at times when we're, you know, projecting our, our own fears onto other people. And I remember you, and I, I'm just so glad that you and Kayla have met because I just remember you and your personality and you just did not care what anybody else thought, you know, and you had a voice, you know, you, I, you feel, had, I feel like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like your personality and, um, you know, that really, I remember like you, and we were like, I remember being at recess and, you know, you were always, you know, there to stick up for whoever you needed to, you know, right. including yourself. So, right. um, and Kayla's question is, how was it in terms of your academics? My academics were okay. Um, I was a little behind because I missed a lot in my early years due to treatment. So academically, I didn't struggle like some do with CP. Some people it affects in that manner. I was very blessed it did not. So I was able to get by okay. Yeah. Sometimes I needed a little extra help, but not always. Yeah. And I feel like, um, yeah. And I, I mean, it's totally changed so much. And I think, you know, from Kayla's perspective, when, when I knew you at three, Kayla, you know, nobody really knew like what you really knew, you know, so figuring out where she was academically because she wasn't speaking. So how do we know that she's, you know, where she is, you know, or, or what, what can she tell us? What can't she tell us? All of that. So that took a lot of problem solving from the team. Um, oh, so did you um, have any 504 accommodations? I, as far as I can remember, I believe I did. Okay. Um, just going to and from classes and things like that. I, I would have to add 
at, as far as I can remember, I did, but I don't think they were intensive. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay, next question. Kayla, what would you, you tell other individuals who have been diagnosed with cerebral palsy at this time? I would tell others to not give up and prove everyone wrong in their unique way. Nobody can predict or limit anyone's future. When I was little, they didn't have if I would be able to do any of the things the general population takes for granted like communication, feeding, drinking through a straw, mobility, fine motor skills, potty training. I am able to transfer myself from my bed to wheelchair or from my wheelchair to the couch. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I get that a lot when I first get clients. I get, where is my kid going to be? Or how long is this going to take? Or, you know, and, and then, oh, the doctor said this or um, you know, put kind of a date on it. And I just say the opposite, you know, like mm -hmm. we don't know. And the only outcome is therapy and inclusion and pushing your child to where you want that you, them to go, you know, and not, or treating them just like everybody else. Um, cause I get that a lot. Um, yeah, and even now, exactly, like being 22 or being in your 40s, like, like you said, I'm going to go skiing, I want to go skiing, you know, or I am going to continue to horseback ride, or I'm going to take five classes, even though, you know, mm. or whatever it is, um, and I agree, I mean, I, that's what I love about my job is, is, you know, or they get a diagnosis, you know, I'll have a, a parent get a diagnosis young and I say, the diagnosis doesn't matter because we're going to treat it the same way and it doesn't matter because it's who, what we do with what we learn. Right. So, um, super important. So how about you, Katrina? What would you like to tell people who have been diagnosed? So they told my mom that I would never walk or talk. So obviously I walk unassisted. I do have an abnormal gait, but very mild since I've had my last two surgeries. And I, people should just concentrate on their ability and not their disability because nobody knows what your ability is going to be until you continue to try. Exactly. So. And what do they already do? What do you already do and how to build on what you already do? So um, I... I am, can't believe I'm doing it in my forties, but I had two hip surgeries in the last year and I finally got cleared to get my driver's license. So that is something I'm working on. Honestly. <laughs> That's up. Oh, then you're going to have to come pick up Kayla and come to yep. New York city. Yep. So <laughs> I don't know if I'll drive in the city, but we can get on the train. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, or we can come to you and you could drive us around a little right. bit. Right. So uh, that is something I'm working on. Um, I wasn't going to do it. And then I'm like, you know what? It really sucks having to rely on people sometimes. And everybody's great. I have a great group of friends, great family. You know, I never go without. Like if I need something, somebody's always there. But just that being able to get in the car and go to work on my own will be nice. Congratulations. So, That's yeah. So that was, you know, with, I wasn't going to do the surgery and then I did it and it paid off. So. Wow. Well, congratulations. Now I can remember when uh, Kayla got her driver's license for her electrical wheelchair. She went from, you know, having, you know, somebody push her to having, I remember with the transition, we couldn't stop her. She was getting speeding tickets <laughs> down the hallway. <laughs> I remember you just wouldn't even put on the brake. You were like, I'm out. Bye. Yeah. So that I am working on that. So probably by the end of May. So watch out. Katrina's on the road. 
<laughs> He's gonna hit the hit the uh, motor just like Kayla did on the, the wheelchair. <laughs> um, okay, so this is so great. I love catching up. Um, so the next question, um, I love how you both have sisters. That just makes me so happy. Um, so I want you to tell me, Kayla, how do your sisters treat you? My sisters are great. They are supportive, caring, compassionate, helpful, and funny. That's really awesome. I don't have sisters. I have a brother. Um, and he's really a good brother, sweet, kind, like caring. And um, we get along really well. Um, so, but I always wanted a sister. And thank goodness I have, you know, good women in my life that, that can um, give me that. Um, now, for Katrina, Katrina has six sisters. Ooh. I have six, I'm right in the middle. So I have three older and three younger. And they've always been great, always supportive, you know, compassionate, helpful, and crazy at times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I meant to ask you, Katrina, were you a late speaker? Yes, I was. I was, I think my mom told me three. Okay. But it wasn't a first word. It was a complete sentence. Wow. So. That's interesting. Yeah. Because the reason I ask that, you know, I do see in my practice, sometimes I do see like mild, mild symptoms of cerebral palsy, um, which obviously I can't diagnose, but some of the speaking behaviors that I see um, definitely warrant more investigation um but you know we need a good core strength to produce speech um so if you don't have core strength and and that could be from your legs which you were sitting you know you're you're sitting a certain way which doesn't give you you know good postural support so it's interesting i, I was just curious about that um but i definitely you know see a lot of kids with core muscle strength that impacts their production of speech, um, whether it's um, too quiet or it's a little dysarthric or, um, but I have seen a couple of cases where I'm not sure that CP was diagnosed because it was so very mild, but it comes out in the speech. Um, but very, I had one case where I was convinced I was like, you know, obviously I, I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose, but I can describe the characteristics. Right. Um, Send him to Weinberg. Yeah, exactly. Send him to Dr. Stalber. Exactly. Um, good to know that for sure. Um, okay, next, Kayla. Tell me about your experience with doctors and therapy. In regards to doctors, I want to talk about a particular milestone I feel is unspoken about as most milestones are celebrated with pictures and videos. You do not hear about the milestone of aging out of pediatrics. I understand that this is a milestone everyone goes through, but I feel like it's harder when you are so grateful for what a medical professional has done for you. For those who don't know, Despite being a full-term baby, my birth was terrifyingly scary with a room full of medical professionals. I was born unconscious and my pediatrician was who performed CPR on me to get me breathing. Even though I have specialists, he was there through all the milestones that got me where I am today. He was always patient, understanding, and funny. For example, I can tell you where I have pain, but I have a hard time explaining pain and he was open-minded. From the bottom of my heart, thank you Dr. Ward for everything including insurance paperwork. I'm also thankful for all the laughs through the years we shared. 
Wow. So he was there when you were born. And is he retired? Oh, you aged out. So, um, so let's hear it from Katrina because I know Katrina has had a you know different experience because of different time. But I think it's important to know you know once you age out what the different options are. So Katrina, you can comment on your experience. Okay, so as far as pediatricians, when I was younger, I had a couple because we moved around a lot. So I don't recall that ever being a problem. But once I turned, I think it was 20 back when I grew up, I aged out of pediatrics as well as the children's hospital where I got my CP care my entire life. So needless to say, they once you're that age, it's like, see you later. Mm -hmm. Nobody for adults. So I went from the time I was 20 up until three years ago with no treatment. Because what I ran into is you tell people you have CP and they get scared. They're not familiar. They're not educated. So they, we can't see you, you know, we, you know, so that's what I ran into. I thankfully have had the same primary care doctor for I think the last 20 years. And he, I think he has all the CP patients in Danbury because he's the only one that was open-minded enough to help. Um, and then they found me Weinberg when I started having hip trouble, the doctors I worked for did. So I was very thankful for that. Wow, so this is different now. Um... That's really interesting because now, Kayla, do you find that your team at, for the next level is, they're ready for you? Oh, no. No. Oh, no. No. Okay. Yeah. Cause you just aged out. Right. So, so this is, I'm so glad I put you both in touch because, you know, Katrina's has, has the people in case, you know, and actually they're in New York. So I'm excited because it's a new contact for me too, um, that I didn't know about. So I will certainly reach out to them because it's really important. Um, so that was awesome. I mean, it's really important, especially I, I can see that, you know, with doctors just being fearful, like, oh, I, I'm not going to touch that because I don't know anything about it. Um, and I have to say, like, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I went to the guy in Manhattan and um, I didn't, I got sick. I lost my hearing because he put me on some major medication. And so I had gotten a second opinion from a doctor that really doesn't know anything about Crohn's. He was like, I don't have a lot of Crohn's patients, but guess what? He did the research and he gave me some other options. So sometimes, um, you know, the opposite is true or, you know, you need to take a holistic approach, whatever the situation is, but you have to be your advocate. You have to be your own advocate because otherwise, you know, <laughs> healthcare today is just a different being, you know, and that's, you know, as a speech therapist, that's why I do what I do and why I don't work for anybody. I work for myself so that I can cater to the needs of my clients. I can go to the home, I can go to their school, I can go out into the community with them, where if I'm, you know, in a hospital, I'm stuck in, you know, one room, no windows, you know, back to back treatments, and then it's time to go home where, you know, they get they get me wherever they want me, basically. Um, so that's really important. And I think for you both, having that option, um, really important. I just had a friend, she, um, we work together at Hospital for Special Surgery, which is really focuses on um, 
the motor system and she got her massage therapist license and does medical massage and she has clients that have cerebral palsy um so she's really um changed a lot of kids lives from stretching and massaging and making them looser um so such a such an important thing that you might kids didn't get any massage and massage is so important um for everybody not just adults um, yeah i've had botox treatment actually oh wow <laughs> okay yeah they it, helped. it helped but i don't think i would do it again <laughs> right right you know, there's so much out there um okay this next question i loved this question because i was like I am curious, how do you view people without disabilities and their overall attitudes on life? Do you want me to answer it first or Kayla? Um, I think she's typing. So. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want Katrina to answer first? Oh, okay. So you already answered it. Mm. No. Oh, my last question. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love how you keep me in line. <laughs> it must be the jet lag. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to know now about your experience with therapy. <laughs> In regards to therapy, I received physical, occupational, and speech therapy from the birth to three program. Once I transitioned to school, I received these services through the district. I have also tried programs like special needs soccer and pool therapy, but the one that has really impacted and blessed me and my family is therapeutic writing. When I started writing at three years old, I was unable to sit unassisted. The therapist had to use a bell to help me sit up. With the repetition of simple exercises, games, and the horse's movements, I was able to quickly overcome the milestone of sitting without a belt. In 2017, I started transitioning to the paradressage discipline as my instructor wanted to challenge me. In paradressage, the horse and rider perform a test that is written from memory and follows a prescribed pattern of movements. This still gives me the therapeutic benefits of riding that I need while challenging me to learn dressage vocabulary and patterns. 
I continue to work towards my goal of riding independently and competing at a paradressage competition. The science behind a riding lesson is complex. As a horse walks, its hips rotate in the same way humans' hips do. The muscles in the rider's hips are massaged throughout the lesson. For a person who is unable to walk, the experience of riding a horse gives the same sensation as actually walking. For someone like me, who needs assistance to walk and is confined to a wheelchair for most of the day, riding reduces my high muscle tone and improves my balance, posture, gait, and stability. Horseback riding stretches my muscles and reduces my spasticity. This allows my movements to be softer, quieter, and more accurate. As the horse moves, I am constantly thrown off balance, requiring my muscles to contract and relax in an attempt to rebalance. Riding requires me to coordinate numerous muscle groups to work together to get the horse to start, stop, turn and bend in the direction we are traveling. And the horse provides constant feedback for me to react to, which in turn improves my motor planning. Stopping and starting the horse, changing speed and changing direction engage my core muscles. Increased core muscle strength directly impacts posture, head and trunk stability which allows me to be as independent as possible. All these benefits help me physically and emotionally get through the day and week and reduce the constant tug of war I have with my own body. This makes participating in daily activities exponentially easier for me. <clears throat> wow. So I love how you have a passion for horse rack, horseback riding and that Katrina, you had skiing as your, um, your sport. Um, and dance. I took dance as well. Dance. So that's really, really important um, to know. I, I would love to get my friend, the massage therapist. We, we can all have massages. That'll be our day. She'll be so excited. I'll be like, we're all going to get massages. You're coming with me. We're going to have a massage day. Um, so that was awesome. Now, um, I want to hear from you then how, how therapy, especially for the skiing, like how did that all take shape? So you have to go through a physical before they would allow you to take every year before they would allow us to take part in the program. And I was just, I'm actually in physical therapy now. I have been probably... 95% of my life. So I go twice a week now. And, but I do hit the gym t two or three times a week on my own. I have a home exercise program that they gave me. So it's an everyday thing for me and it does help. Um, people don't realize that that's like the number one treatment. So it does improve gait posture and all the things that Kayla mentioned. I was just discussing it with the physical therapist today that I wanted to get back into skiing and he said, go for it. <laughs> so he did say that if the doctor says it's okay, I'll put together a program and work with you over the next year so that you're ready for next season. So that's, I don't see the doctor till July. So I will discuss that with him when I. And then we're going skiing girl. Yep. <laughs> Definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. All right, guys. So, or ladies. I don't know why I always say guys when I mean girls, ladies. Um, okay. Um, last question, which is this question I think is really important to me. How do you view people without disabilities and their overall attitudes on life? Kayla. I view people with disabilities the same way I want them to view myself and anyone else, no matter their background. Everyone needs to be respected, cared for, and so much more. I love it. So what I love is that, you know, there is so much more awareness and the fact that like, whether you're in a wheelchair or you're not in a wheelchair or you don't have anything physical that looks like there's something wrong with you, but you could have, 
you know, mental illness, you could have a chronological disease, or you could have a stroke or none of that, right? But it's important that we honor people's strengths, weaknesses, or, or feelings, right? I think the feelings part is, is super important. Um, we don't realize like feelings are valid, you know, we have to, to give people a chance to feel and um, speak their mind, communicate, um, and that we are all people first. We are all human beings um, and nothing else matters other than we are one, we, we are all the same. Um, so how about you, Katrina? Uh, overall, people have been decent. Um, I do know a lot of people without disabilities have a lot to complain about. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, listen, until you live a week in my shoes, try me a river. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, but overall, um, I've had good experiences, you know, because I am ambulatory, I do get the stairs in public. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people whisper, I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me anymore. But if I'm with my sisters, <laughs> that's not going to fly because they can be crazy. But, and I find that the adults are worse than the children. For sure. sometimes. And it's just lack of knowledge. They just don't know what right. they're seeing, you know, and that's the whole point of CP Awareness Month is to let people know that it's a very common thing. It's more common now than when I was born. I think they said last I heard it was like 4%. 4%. So wow. that's pretty common, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's just awareness and it's just doing things like this to make people aware what what it is. And so that'll diminish over time, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm living in New York City, um, it's it's very interesting because I used to play soccer and softball in leagues here. And then I was like, you know what? I don't want to play because I don't want to get hurt. Cause if I get hurt and I can't use the subway or I'm limping or, you know, the people move so fast here, they don't care. They're just on, you know, one, but then, you know, it's interesting because if I get caught behind somebody who has crutches or a wheelchair or um, like buses pick up wheelchair people in wheelchairs and it takes time and it's really you know someone who doesn't have a disability it takes you know awareness and then you know putting yourself in their shoes you know to to see what they have to go through I mean getting on a bus here in New York when you are wheel you're in a wheelchair is that is practice and patience you know, for themselves and then to deal with other people and their, their impatience. So mm -hmm. I'm so aware of that. Um, you know, and I, I catch myself, you know, to be perfectly honest, I've been in the situation where I'm like, I have to get somewhere I'm late and, you know, someone's walking slow and it's like, calm it down. You know, <laughs> like you don't know what it's like to have, you know, that, and they don't care. They're, they're happy. I see most people with disabilities are smiling. Right. And I, I've truly been blessed with how mild I was affected. So I know that because I've learned so much since I've been going to Weinberg that I'm truly blessed. So I'm the one that always holds the door open for the wheelchair person or the person with the cane, or I have a lot of patience for it. There is always somebody out there that's worse off than you. And that's what I live by. That's true. And, uh, and uh, Kayla just wrote in the comments, New York City field trips. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and the thing is, the city is really getting better. Um, and I have to say, I live in a, a pre-war building. Um, it's built in the 1900s or before, and there's no elevator and it's a five story building. And now People with Disabilities Act is really putting pressure on buildings to put in elevators. There's no, you know, because the aging too, there's, there's um, ad adults that are aging and they can't get up the stairs. So I'm so happy that this is happening because, you know, it's like my parents, you know, they're getting older. It's harder for them to climb up the stairs. 
Um, so this is a huge push in New York. And then, you know, New York, their, their elevators were terrible. And now they're getting better. There's more, you know, they're, they're reinventing the, the subway um, and all these new buildings with all these fun things. So. so I had an experience like that when I went to New York City. Before I had prepping for my hip surgery, I had to go for a special MRI. You know where Radio City Music Hall is? Uh, yeah. I went right across the street to that Columbia building there. And I pull up and he says to me, I said, where's your handicapped parking? He said, you can park in the garage three blocks that way, or I can charge you $65 for, for um, valet parking. And I said, well, what happened to ADA? Where's your handicap park? And he said, those are your two choices. So what choice? I said, well, if I could walk three blocks, I wouldn't be here for an MRI. <laughs> so I paid 65 bucks and they took the car and I had my MRI. <laughs> wow. See, that's, that's New York. And it's, but it's, it is getting better, which is good. Um, but I, 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 I watched the, you know, this happen all the time. And I'm like, wow, there's no, and it's just so crowded. Um, yeah, super frustrating. And, you know, and just the, the transportation system, I mean, because cars congest the city. So we rely on public transportation all the time. I mean, now that pandemic happened, I, I really haven't been on the subway much, um, but that's how you get around New York, the fastest, the quickest. Um, well, I had so much fun today. This was amazing. I do want Katrina to show off her shirt um can you see it yeah it says i make cerebral palsy look good and that is absolutely true i got kayla one but i didn't have i have to get her address it wasn't next time she can wear it we can be yeah matching. next <laughs> time we have one of these we can and we can continue these discussions and i think you know reaching out to the public and at you know having them ask us questions too is super important um but I had so much fun. This was so great. And I know that Kayla is like a student right now. So she's got a lot of work going on. So by accident, I sent her a Zoom request that the time was in her class. And she was like, I don't have, to, I can't do that. <laughs> I got to be in class. And I'm like, I can't do that either. It's past my bedtime. So I have yeah, a lot of to do now bed technology. <laughs> Um, yeah, and Kayla was saying, um, you know, in the suburbs or in the country, there isn't public transportation, so. I live in Danbury, so I have it here, which has been a blessing to me since I wasn't driving. I did get door to door when I needed it, but I do have a good family and friends, so I didn't really use it as much as I could have, but I do have it available. I'm so excited nice. about your license. That's awesome. That's super exciting. Yeah, scary for me, but. I'll do it. I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like both of you take on those scary, risky. Oh, yeah. Always. Skiing and horseback riding. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. like, don't do downhill, do cross country. I'm like, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember you flying down. You didn't care. I don't uh, know if I would do the black diamonds again, though. Oh, my God. I don't know if in my 40s that's such a I don't think I, I would do. do them anymore either. <laughs> Have you, do you still ski? So I am a princess. I do not like it to be cold. So my last skiing experience was actually in Flagstaff, Arizona. It was St. Patrick's Day and it was very balmy and I skied without a jacket on and I will never ski again. <laughs> Cause I was like, this is just beautiful. This is you how- You told me you are gonna ski when I start skiing. So you, I know, you gotta hold so it. I have to get used to it. But that was the last time and being um, West, the snow is just so different. It's, there's no ice, you don't, you know, but yeah, I haven't skied since, so. I haven't skied since 96. Right. 96, I think. So we'll ski again. We'll ski again. <laughs> what girl, Kayla says, what girl isn't a princess? Well, oh, I'm a diva. <laughs> I'm like, I like to be, I'm like, I want to be warm. I don't want to be sweating when it's over because then I'm cold. So, but we'll get out there for sure. That would be amazing. 
Kayla should look into Skiers Unlimited at the Children's Hospital because they can get her on the slopes and then we can all go together. That'll be fun. Look at that, Kay. You have a whole different hobby to, to pick up, a sport. So fun. So I am going to, we're going to say goodbye to everybody. Um, so this was Silver Speech Speaker Series. And Kayla has one more thing to say because she's not finished. She's always yelling at me. <laughs> Which is great because she, I used Keeps to- you grounded. Yeah. I used to be so hard on her with her speech. Now she can be hard on me with my speech. <laughs> so do you have anything else to say, Kay? Oh, 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 oh. You did have something to say? Oh. Oh, she already did snowmobile on her quad. Oh, nice. So she snowmobiles on her quad. Your dad has snowmobiles, right? Mobile and quad. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. I've never done snowmobiling, I don't think. Oh, and skied. Did you ski too? No. Oh, yeah, I figured dad had them for sure. Mm. Um, living in Terryville, Plymouth, there's there's a lot of open land there. Yeah. Versus Bristol, we're a big city. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we were even that big, but Bristol. it's getting there now, though. That's it. I know. It's All not right, the girl. small town that we grew up in anymore. I know, right? Yeah. All right, girls, it was such a pleasure. I am going to stop the video and let's see hold on